much for having us here today. We're really excited to be here. Um, before we get started, our Twitter handle is at New Profit. Only tweet nice things. Um, and oh, it's funny, we were going to start our session by asking how many people had already started ventures, how many people had gotten them funded. So for those of you who have already received some funding, we'll definitely be looking to you during Q&A to also share some stories about what you've done and, and what you've learned with others. Um, New Profit does not fund early stage startups. So just want to put that out there from the start. That said, many of the organizations that we do fund started in universities, started at this stage, and we may have even started talking with them all the way back at the beginning. So what we love to do is when we see high potential, help organizations really develop the skills and the tools to eventually get to a place where they might be ready for an investment from someone like New Profit or one of our other peers in the space. Um, so this is an introduction. You might notice that Leah looks a little bit different. Um, Leah is actually. A winter beard. <laughs> um, so Leah is stuck on a flight um, out of DC. She was meeting with some funders about our early childhood domain. Um, but she might make it uh, in time, and if she doesn't, then Sam is, is standing in for her. I'm a low-budget stand-in. <laughs> um, and so I kind of pride myself on having had a variety of odd jobs. I've been uh, an interviewer of pig farmers in rural Vietnam. I've been a cocktail waitress in a karaoke bar. Um, I've been a masked performer at Foxwoods Casino. Uh, but I would say the jobs I've had that are most relevant to what I do now at New Profit are uh, management consulting uh, with a for-profit firm. And then I did a lot of fundraising and development within the nonprofit space before coming to New Profit. Am I supposed to invite, do I introduce myself or Leah? Uh, maybe yourself, okay. in case Leah doesn't make it. So standing in for Leah, I'm Sam Hersteiner. I'm the communications director at New Profit. Um, my background is much less varied. I was in uh, PR and advertising for a long time and designing and running advocacy campaigns for nonprofits and foundations. And uh, Kelly has been at New Profit for about four years. I've been around for about a year uh, working on a wide variety of our various programs. Kelly, much more on the investment selection, working directly with social entrepreneurs. I am more on the marketing and communication side, substanceless. <laughs> and so we've organized the agenda by New Profit's seven core values. And I'll take a moment, read them. I think they're pretty cool. So uh, this, this is kind of what we live and breathe by every day. What we hope that you come away with is just a little bit of an understanding of who we are, what we do, why we do it, um, but really some skills and some tools that you can think about when you walk out of this room that you can be developing to better position your own venture. Um, we'll say a little bit about how we fit into the broader funding landscape as well, and want to do a lot of Q&A to just address what's top of mind for you. Uh, so New Profit, we call ourselves a venture philanthropy fund, and really what that means is that we take principles from the venture capital market and we apply them to the nonprofit sector. Um, our mission, we exist to break down barriers to opportunity in America, and we do that by funding uh, mainly nonprofits to do work in the education space, in the early childhood space, in public health, um, and also in workforce training. So New Profit was founded to address the question, how come social innovations don't scale at the same degree um, and with the same consistency that for-profit innovations scale? Uh, our founder and current CEO, Vanessa Kirsch, uh, she pondered this question back in 1995. She had founded two organizations at that point. Um, both of them still exist today. 
And she and her, at the time, boyfriend, Alan Kazai, um, who was uh, one of the co-founders of City Year, uh, they took a trip around the world, uh, visited 22 countries, interviewing social entrepreneurs. And while they were in a rural village in Vietnam, they basically came across a village that had a really simple, inexpensive innovation that was saving lives of children. And what it amounted to was that they had realized that if you ground up uh, shrimp and add it to the food, that the children's nutrition was just dramatically improved. And so they saw this innovation, went down the river to a neighboring village. Just down the river, um, children did not have the same innovation, were malnutri malnutrition, and were basically uh, you know, dying at a young age because this simple innovation had not made it over there. And yet what they found was that all along this river, you could find a bottle of Coca-Cola pretty much anywhere that you went. It tasted the same. Um, and I think this just led her to say, you know, what is it? Like, what would the world look like if social innovations that worked could scale in the same way that for-profit innovations scaled? And so she came back to Boston. Um, she founded New Profit, and really with a vision to transform the way that philanthropy happens to ensure that innovations can scale. So just a couple of facts. You might know some of this, but nearly every day, about 150 nonprofit organizations are founded. Um, it's just it's staggering. And yet, of those organizations, uh, only 96% of them actually get to an annual revenue that goes beyond $1 million. Um, and revenue, you know, just a proxy for scale. But you know, think about how many small nonprofits there are and how many of them are, are uh, coming onto the market every day. And uh, if you look at nonprofits that have been founded since 1970, only about 200 have actually attained revenue of $50 million or more. And so it's, it's essentially a problem of scale that we exist to address. So New Profit has a, basically a three-prong approach to addressing this problem. Um, the first is that we invest in visionary leaders to help them scale their solutions. Uh, we have 28 organizations who are currently a part of our portfolio. We've worked with 44 organizations in total. Um, they cover some of the areas that I've mentioned, education, workforce development, public health, early childhood. And what we do is a combination of financial support and strategic support. We'll say a tiny bit more about that later. We also do work around advocacy. Um, so we basically have a coalition of about 60 organizations who make up uh, what we call America Forward. And they advocate for stronger outcomes and a more efficient use of government resources. Uh, one thing that they helped to do in 2007 was uh, sort of inspire the White House Office for Social Innovation to be born. And then the third thing that we do is about convening. So we've discovered that if you bring together leaders across diverse sectors to wrestle with problems together, that we come up with much more innovative solutions. So our main platform for convening is called The Gathering for Leaders. Um, and what I'll say is that we're going to focus on number one, investing in visionary entrepreneurs, because I think that's the area that's going to be of most interest to this group. Yeah. You mentioned 40 to 60 nonprofits. Yeah. Do you also fund and uh, advocate and collaborate with uh, for, so for profit social enterprises? Yeah, so the majority of what we do is nonprofit. Um, we have made, I think at this point, it's just two investments in um, for-profit ventures. And so I'd say we're, we're open to that idea. It hasn't been historically where we've had as much experience. Um, but the world is really changing. And you know, I feel like the walls between those distinctions are just really different than what they were a decade ago. So I wouldn't be surprised if we move a little further in that direction. One of those examples, the Harvard Sib Lab has been involved with social impact bonds, and we have been uh, partnered with them in various different ways. But the Massachusetts Juvenile Justice Pay for Success Initiative is one of the for-profit investments that we are involved in. Is there another question over here? No? OK. 
And so who do we fund? Um, many of these organizations at this point have become household names. Uh, KIPP is a network of high-performing charter schools. Many of you have probably heard of them. Um, health Leads is redefining healthcare system to address patients' basic, basic needs. Um, founded out of Harvard. Yes, founded out of Harvard. Um, and Year Up empowers young adults to move from poverty into the professional world within a year. Um, this is just a small sample. Uh, and if you're interested in knowing more about the other organizations we fund, happy to talk about them and give examples. You can obviously also find them on our website. So once we find an organization and go through the process of determining that they are a good fit for us, and we're going to say more about that, um, the way that we like to fund an organization is with an eye towards um, building the organization as opposed to buying a programmatic outcome. This is actually really different from how most funders fund. Uh, if you look at a lot of philanthropy, it's about funding only program, not any sort of general operating support, not any sort of R&D, none of the work that goes behind making the program successful. And Vanessa, running her own organizations, struggling with finding this funding, said, it's just, it's ridiculous. You know, funders need to fund unrestricted, transformative gifts. And so that's what we aim to do. Our initial investment is $1 million paid out over four years for a subgroup of organizations. At the end of that investment, we'll also do a second round of funding. Um, generally, that's uh, what we would call a growth capital investment to help them basically take step function growth. What we do in terms of finance is matched in value by what we do in terms of strategy. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, but this is the area that we think potentially would be of most interest to you. Um, these are the criteria that we use to guide our decision making. Um, and we can go into more or less detail on these depending on where people have questions. We basically look at five main categories. Um, social entrepreneur, direct impact, systemic impact, capacity for growth, and new profit fit. So one thing that we learned from the venture space is the importance of the leader at the helm of an organization. And I would say more than anything, we actually prioritize the leader um, beyond any of these other, other areas. So we're looking for people who are visionary. We're looking for people who make um, data-oriented, tough choices. And we're looking for people who are uh, magnets for resources. So unlike some funders who say, you seem like you have enough, you know, we're not going to help out. We're like, wow, you're getting a lot of attention and a lot of focus and a lot of resources. There's probably something here, and we want to find out more. Um, the second area is direct impact. So by the time we do an investment, an organization generally has programs that are up and running and will have begun to understand a little bit about their outcomes. So we don't expect that an organization has a full-scale evaluation done, but that they're oriented to data, they're collecting data, and they have some promising outcomes. Um, the third element, I'd say, is a bit unique to New Profit, um, and this is systemic impact. And what we mean by that is we've learned over time that no matter how much an organization can scale what they're doing on the ground, it's probably not going to be enough to actually drive the type of transformative change that our social entrepreneurs hope to drive. And so we look for organizations who have an idea to do something beyond just the direct work. So it could be something related to policy. Um, it could be something related to uh, changing hearts and minds through media. But it's something beyond just the direct work on the ground. And I, just to add to that, I mean, I think that this is a good, you, Kelly was pointing back to the three areas of our work, the investing, advocating, and then convening. Um, I think it took us some time to get to that point as well. I mean, I think our original 
vision was that systemic impact could happen through just scaling direct service and intervention. We added later on the ideas that we need to, to leverage policy and do all these other convening activities uh, if we wanted to reach that level of scale. And that's, you know, that's a, that's probably doesn't scream out to every early stage entrepreneur that we need to be, that you need to be involved and aware and understanding of all these other levers for social change to be successful, I think, pitching your own ideas. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point. I'd say for, for early stage folks who are just getting their ventures off the ground, it's not going to be where you focus the majority of your energy, but even just having an orientation towards thinking in that way, I think can be really powerful. Um, the fourth place is capacity for growth. And that's something where we try to understand, is this a scalable model? And do you have some evidence that you've been able to scale it so far? So we actually like to fund, for instance, if you're a direct service model that intends to grow geographically, we'd like to see that you've already replicated to an additional city so that you've at least tried it out in a different venue and you've kind of tinkered with what works and what doesn't work. Um, and then the last part is new profit fit. Because we, because we do so much um, with the organization beyond just the finances, we want to make sure that what we know to do well is well aligned with what the needs are of the organization. Questions? Uh, just going back to capacity for growth, I saw their healthy financial management. And just since you're investing in uh, non for profit or just yeah, not profit businesses. How do you define healthy financial management? Is it just like having a balanced budget where you where your profit is zero, or are, are you willing to invest in entities that are losing money, or how do you just define mm -hmm. healthy financial management? Yep, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so because we fund past the, past the startup phase, um, we are generally looking for organizations who have a couple of years of ideally having um, a bit of a surplus. And so you're already past the point of, you know, of losing money. And because we all know, even in the nonprofit sector, you know, you you're, you're still need to be at, at a balance and ideally having some surplus. So it's a different stage of funder who is willing to say, you have an idea, I have a vision. I, I believe in your vision, and I'm willing to put money behind you getting it up and running. Once you've gotten it to a place where you actually have a couple of years of managing the revenue and expense side of it, then we can take a look and say, ha, huh, like what are they doing in terms of managing their funds, and what systems do they have to understand things like cash flow and reserves, um, and for a lot of organizations, um, you know, it might take some time to actually build out those skills and capabilities to be able to really manage the cash. Um, but I'd love to see if others have questions on this area in particular, because um, you know, I'd say it, it's within these five categories that there may be particular skills that this group might be curious about further developing. Move on. Okay. Okay. So, my background's in education, and, mm -hmm. and I'm looking at direct impact and and the outputs and outcomes. Yeah. You know, what's kind of your metrics on understanding, like, like how are people quantifying, and what are you really looking for in terms of outcomes over a span of time? I guess with mm -hmm. those initiatives. Sure. Yeah. So I'd say you know at a baseline, um, when you're starting. Make sure you are collecting as much data as you possibly can. I mean, I think at the beginning, it's just having an orientation towards data and truly being curious about what you're learning. So the thing that we like to see most is that an organization has you know, a pretty rapid loop of trying something out, collecting data about what's working and what's not working, taking that data back in, modifying what they're doing, trying it out again. And we think that, I mean, that's going to happen for, for, in a good organization, that never stops. Um, but so at the beginning, it's just building out the baseline systems to be able to do that. And then, um, you know, it's further out that you can actually get more sophisticated. At the beginning, you're probably just measuring the inputs. 
and maybe some of the outputs, it might be a while before you can actually say that an outcome can truly be attributed to, to what you've done. Um, because we're looking at organizations that are a little bit further in their maturity, we generally do have a proxy for, you know, for example, if it's a college access organization, we can look at other college access organizations in the space and say, for this intervention, um, how many kids are they getting into college? How many of them are persisting for their first two years? How many of them are making it through to graduation? What's the cost of the model? And how does that compare with others in the landscape? And then that's how we'll do some of the comparison. Um, but when you're starting, I feel like the baseline is just collect, 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 and don't collect and put on a shelf, but collect and actively use that to learn about the model and to continuously evolve it. Can you give an example of uh, someone in your portfolio who has um, combined the systemic impact with direct service? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, one organization that comes to mind is, uh, is Teach for America is one of our early um, organizations. And I'd say at the time that Wendy Kopp first started working with us, um, a lot of her emphasis was on the outcomes of the students who were being taught by the TFA, um, by the TFA teachers. And in our work together, I think what we came to understand was that she really had a hypothesis about what was powerful for the teachers who were doing the teaching. And so what she came to articulate about her systemic impact strategy was that it wasn't just about changing the lives of the children in the classrooms. It was about creating a whole generation of education reformers. And those education reformers would go out and start their own organizations and do their own education reform, and there would be this ripple effect beyond what was happening in the classroom. And so we've actually, so many of the organizations who come to us um, are started by TFA alums, because they've then built into their program the leadership development of that, that cadre of teachers so that they're inspired beyond their time there to do something in the space. Health leads might be another interesting example to share. I mean, yeah. Health Leads was started, uh, are you guys all familiar with Health Leads? Health Leads has started to kind of build the link between poverty and health. They, they place volunteers in low-income clinics to give non-health uh, guidance to folks who come out of health checkups about heating assistance, food, and other things that surround the health issues. Um, that vision of direct service was helped them, I think they're in six over the course of mm -hmm. 10 to 15 years, they, be, they got into six metropolitan areas. They were serving you know, above tens of thousands of recipients with this. But all along, Rebecca Oni and the other folks who founded this organization had a vision for going much further than that and changing the healthcare system. This year, and she talks very eloquently about how systems are the issue, not geography. And this year, they made a big push in the direction of much more larger scale change. So they've now booked a, big partnership with Kaiser Permanente in California to seed their model for service and counseling into Kaiser's network. And you know the point of doing that is that hopefully they can all get better outcomes together across that system and then lead other big systems to follow. So when you talk to Rebecca, she basically has a list of 10 healthcare systems in the country that she would be her top targets to get inside and change the way that they behave. If you can get far enough, I think you're looking at maybe, you know, change across the whole healthcare system. So that's the type of thinking that we really love to look at and embrace with all the organizations. And there are other examples of organizations that are using tech to do some of these things, and we could go into them as well. Yeah. How do you go about assessing uh, these five components? Mm -hmm. um, awesome, because that's our next slide. Okay. <laughs> um, so th this visual just represents an illustration of the funnel. And so it's a highly competitive process. Every year we're talking to more than 150 organizations and um, most of them come to us through referrals. And part of why I say that is because when we think about our organizations who started at universities and you know, I think about the stories of how did they get their first funding? How did it happen? Um, you know, I was just talking to someone today who was reflecting on how so-and-so got connected through a professor 
to someone who is working at Atlantic Philanthropies. This is um, MLT, Management Leaders for Tomorrow. Um, John Rice is their CEO. And uh, you know, basically through this connection, was able to make a compelling enough pitch that this person was willing to back them. And so the connections, the relationships, the referrals are so, so critical um, to get your foot in the door, especially at, this, at the early stage. Um, once we build that pipeline, we then take, um, we open an application so that organizations can formally apply. They fill out an application. I won't bore you with all of those details unless you want to hear more about it. Um, but as they get in, we, we assess the potential based on, really based on that basic application at first. But for the organizations who uh, we believe are the highest potential, we do a really in-depth due diligence process. And it's one of the things that I think New Profit is most known for. Um, we'll spend 200 plus hours um, interviewing the social entrepreneur, interviewing their board members, interviewing the senior team, digging through their financials, digging through their impact data, um, visiting their program site. Uh, so really just getting a deep understanding of who they are, what their vision is, what they've accomplished. Um, and at the end of that process, yay, here's Leah. <laughs> Um, so at the end of that process, um, we invite a select number of social entrepreneurs to do a formal pitch for our board of directors. And that's a pitch that will actually coach them uh, pretty rigorously on, on how to best pitch. So also, if people have questions about that, I'm happy to talk more about that. And then after pitching for our board, it's our board who actually ratifies the investments. But you can see this funnel is indicative, but um, this is a, actually based on one cycle where we were looking at about 150 and we made four investments that year. Next year, we'll probably make um, six new investments and then a handful of reinvestments. Um, so pretty competitive, but not probably not more competitive than getting into the Harvard Innovation Lab. Yes. What are your incentives? Because so I worked at the IFC and sometimes mm -hmm. we were driven by Bob, like management, like senior management saying, you have to like disperse this amount of money. Mm. Um, so do you have similar goals? I just feel like sometimes there are perverse incentives to not do the right projects and look for bigger projects. Yeah, it's interesting. I, we, so we are ourselves funded by mostly high net worth individuals. I mean, we are ourselves, we're an intermediary. You know, our designation is nonprofit. Um, we fundraise from people who want to have a transformative impact with their giving, and they get the model. A lot of them come from private equity, or I guess less private equity, actually more venture capital consulting, sort of business backgrounds. And they want to work with an organization who's going to do the diligence for them, and then who is going to do more than just provide the funding, but actually when we talk about our model, you'll see that we take a seat on the board. Um, we do a lot of tools and skill building. Um, so really our incentive is to find the best deals and then to find the deals that we think we can really help scale their impact. And that's what's going to make our investors happy. Um, we're not looking for a financial return. It really is a social return. So I'd say we don't face that same uh, you know, perverse motivation that you mentioned. So I've started to say, I've referenced a couple of times, we do more, more than just um, financial support. And so one of, our, uh, one of our partners at New Profit will take a seat on the board of directors of an organization. And we will provide what we call deal support. We generally organize it into these three categories because we found these categories to be the greatest levers in driving change. So we work on leadership, impact, scale and sustainability. Leadership means coaching the social entrepreneur, working with the management team, helping to build the board of directors. Um, impact, by the time most organizations have been with us for more than four years, they're at the point of completing a formal evaluation process. Um, in terms of scale, we have a great partnership with Deloitte, um, which we're, we're just really grateful for. 
and we'll work with Deloitte and the organization to help an organization do growth planning. Um, on average, our portfolio has grown by about 31% each year in terms of lives touched and about 27% in terms of revenue. Um, and this is just really big growth in terms of how that compares with the rest of nonprofits in this space. Growth alone doesn't matter though unless you're having impact. And so, you know, I'm always clear that we're not about growth just for growth's sake alone. Um, and then we do a lot of work on financial sustainability. So we've done 11 growth capital campaigns at this point where we've helped organizations raise uh, anywhere between 10 to $30 million. And we like to be basically a cornerstone for that campaign to help attract other resources towards the organization. Um, does anyone have questions about kind of what we do with organizations before we move on to whether or not it's even working? Yeah, I, I, I do actually. Yeah, great. <laughs> um, and I wonder if, if it's uh, possible to um, illustrate this with a couple of examples of, um, so you, I think you've been very clear about um, how you get to know an organization, how they mm -hmm. come to you, your due diligence, the 200 hours, and then the selection of the four and maybe the six in the future <laughs> and the, the selection of refunds. Um, but I think it'd be helpful if we had a couple more examples of, of what's a, you know, what's been a successful ap applicant. Yep. So what, um, what distinguishes a, su a successful applicant from one who maybe doesn't make it? Uh, I think that's, that, that's terrific. And I also think, you know, there are, got a, there are likely a couple of typologies of, of, of those organizations because they're coming to you. My mm. sense is from what you've described, they're at least probably three years mm -hmm. old, right? Yeah. Um, and how you, um, how you look at that first year and, uh, I mean, some of them, of course, they would meet you when they're in their third year and you would be doing your due diligence and looking back. But if that's possible to um, look at. Sure, sure. Yeah, and I'll also, um, I'll, I'll introduce Leah and I'll speak on this, but also feel free to chime in as well. I'm so glad you made it. I know, me too. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Can you, is this, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. <laughs> um, great. So it's, it's really interesting. And I call in Leah because um, Leah and I both do what we call discovery calls together. And this is basically a board member refers an organization to us. We get on the phone with them for a half hour and try to assess, you know, could this even be a fit? And I'd say what's kind of amazing is that um, you can kind of tell within, I mean, it's a little bit cliche, but you can kind of tell within 10 minutes, you know, if there's really going to be potential there. I mean, you don't know if they're going to make it down that funnel, but you might have a sense of if you're going to encourage them to apply or if you're going to say, you know, maybe not us and maybe point them another direction. Um, and I would say, a lot of it has to do with the leader's clarity about what problem they're trying to solve, how their solution uniquely addresses that problem, and what their aspiration is for growing that solution. It sounds simple, but it's so hard to do. It is so hard to do in a simple enough way and just in an eloquent way, it, because to us, when you're in it, it feels so obvious that you almost forget that other people don't understand all of the pieces that you understand. Um, so I'd say getting really simple and crisp and clear about what the problem is, what your unique solution is, and what your vision is for growing it. Yeah, and I would add that, and this goes hand in hand with gaining that clarity, but when we see an early social entrepreneur who has really attracted the, some early resources um, that indicate that they're on a trajectory towards uh, really accelerated growth, that's another sign that it's a, it's a social entrepreneur who we're going to want to watch. So um, if, you're, if you have an organization that has a board, um, you know, who are some of your early board members? Who introduced you, us to you in the first place? Um, have you been able to make those initial um, really um, sort of high power connections that indicate that you will be able to continue to lead the organization on an upward tra trajectory. Mm -hmm. 
Was that specific enough? Uh, it was. Um, it was a very good answer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, it's satisfying. Thank you. Okay. Great. And so we're going to move to a little bit of how are we doing? Are we achieving our mission? I'm going to pass it to Leah. Um, but but loving the interaction. So ask questions as we go. So hi again, everyone. I'm so sorry for being late. Um, it rained, and apparently um, that affects airplanes and <laughs> their ability to take off and land on time. So really glad to have joined um, just in time um, to have some of this conversation with you all. Uh, again, my name is Leah staub Long, and I'm a manager on the portfolio investment team at New Profit. And I work closely with Kelly uh, to manage our investment strategy and selection process. And I also manage our early childhood domain, um, which is one of our new focus areas, um, and support a couple of the organizations in our portfolio. Uh, so I wanted to bring you back to this question, this founding question that I think Kelly brought up um, at the beginning of the presentation, which is, why, doesn't, why don't social innovations that work scale like Coca-Cola? And we haven't quite answered that question, uh, but we have helped a good number of social innovations that are working to scale. Um, so, sorry, just getting my bearings a little bit here. Uh, so over the past 15 years, we've invested in 44 organizations that we've supported to grow, and Kelly talked a little bit about the, the uh, growth rate that we see in the organizations that we support. Uh, we have actually doubled down on 15 of those investments um, that we see having true potential for achieving transformative scale. So after our first four years supporting some of our organizations, we'll double down with another investment that's generally um, more money over a, around the same amount of time to really help those organizations um, achieve step function growth. And the organizations that we have supported have together reached 9 billion lives uh, over the course of the last 15 years. And I want to go back to what Kelly was saying about um, scale doesn't necessarily equal impact. And so I'm, I'm not holding this number up to say, um, you know, we've done it, we are effective. Um, what I am doing is holding up a number that can be aggregated um, across the diversity of all of our portfolio to demonstrate how we've been able to increase the reach of the organizations that we're working with. Another number on this slide that I want to draw your attention to is actually on the, um, the bottom axis, the x-axis. And it's the number of donors that we've engaged. So over the last 15 years, we have worked with 260 donors who are generally high net worth individuals and family foundations. And I want to pull this number out as an indicator of our success uh, because it really indicates the way that we have been able to shift, uh, to play a role in shifting the field of philanthropy at large. Uh, to me, the large number of donors who are engaging with us is a sign of an increasing awareness um, in the philanthropic field of the importance of the type of funding that we provide um, and of the importance of scaling social innovations that work. And we've also seen, in addition to our own success engaging funders and really seeing more and more interest uh, from the philanthropic sector in what we're doing, uh, we've seen an increase in organizations that look sort of like us in the field, so organizations that we would call venture philanthropy organizations. And we recently surveyed 13 of these organizations to get a sense of what the lay of the land looks like today. Um, and where we fit in. So the graphic that you see up here shows the organizations that we included in this survey and the years that they were founded. And as you can see, the last 15 years or so have been a really big 15 years for the field of venture philanthropy. So nine of the 13 organizations that we surveyed uh, were founded after our founding in 1998. And Another detail about this slide that I actually find pretty interesting is that a couple of the organizations that were founded earlier than us, so in the 1980s, um, Echo and Green and Ashoka, those are both organizations that are supporting entrepreneurs uh, and their ideas as opposed to the organization. 
Uh, and I think that the fact that these organizations were founded earlier on is really a, a sign of what the field looked like back then. Um, so we didn't have this developed uh, social innovation ecosystem that we see today, um, but we had social innovators, we had entrepreneurs, we've always had entrepreneurs. And so these organizations really started up to, to start to build the ecosystem uh, to, to essentially create a pipeline for the organizations that started up later um, in, this, in the timeline that you see here. Um, and just one anecdote to bring that home, Vanessa Kirsch, who is our founder and current CEO, uh, was actually one of the first Echoing Green Fellows and incubated um, an idea from, for one of her early nonprofits during her time at Echoing Green. So, all of the organizations that we surveyed provide unrestricted support to the organizations that they fund. And by unrestricted, I don't mean limitless. I mean uh, not restricted to a specific program or activity. And as Kelly may have talked about um, earlier in the presentation, this is really a core part of our model and a, a core need that we met when we were founded 15 years ago. We also see that there's a really, uh, there's a, a complete ecosystem of funders out there who are funding organizations across the, their life, their sort of organizational life stages. Um, so the, this graphic may be a bit confusing. Um, we actually took out the names because it was sort of a back of the envelope calculation and we didn't want to mischaracterize anyone. Um, but essentially each of these colored boxes represents a venture philanthropy organization in the field. And you can see that some of the organizations actually span across um, or the organizational life stage. So some funders will fund early to late, uh, while others will focus more on specifically on a couple of life stages. And we found that funders tend to, there's funders uh, fund a range of issues, of course, uh, but the issues that are the most, uh, the most commonly funded, the most popular among funders in this space have to do with K-12 education, early education, um, youth development, college access, there's a theme here, education is the theme, um, and workforce development and poverty alleviation, which I would actually bucket into their own little theme. Um, Organizations did fund a diversity of issues, so uh, many of the organizations that responded to our survey also included public health, as we fund public health, um, hunger issues, uh, but this is where you see the most funding in the field, and I think if you look on the other side um, to, you know, where are we seeing organizations, where are we seeing social entrepreneur-led organizations, we would see a little bit of a parallel here, that there tend to be more organizations focused on um, levers such as education, workforce development. So we asked funders how heavily they weight different criteria in their funding decisions. And we found that funders were often pretty aligned with how other funders are often pretty aligned with how we approach our investment selection in that they're betting on you, they're betting on your talent, and they're betting on your idea. So the three criteria across the board that funders said, uh, you know, this is one of the most important criteria for us in making our decision uh, were the strength of the social entrepreneur, number one, the strength of the social entrepreneur's team, and strategic fit with the organization and its priorities. And I want to pause on these for a second because I, I think these, these words can feel a little nebulous. A strong entrepreneur, what does that actually mean? Um, and we, actually, we touched on this a little bit, I think, um, in answering your question. Um, but I can say from New Profit's perspective, when we are meeting an entrepreneur for the first time and we're, we're trying to sort of feel out, you know, is this, is this a New Profit type entrepreneur? Um, we're really looking at that individual's ability to really clearly articulate uh, what is my vision for changing the sector in which I'm working? How am I doing it? And how will a partnership with you help me to uh, really supercharge my growth and accelerate my growth? Um, we also, as I mentioned, look for social entrepreneurs who are magnetic. And I think that actually relates um, very closely with that second bullet point on this list, which is the strength of the senior team. Um, we are betting on an individual, and part of what we need to see in the individual is their ability to attract and to retain 
uh, top-notch talent because one person is not going to be able to change a system by themselves. They need, they need to build a team. They need to build an army to really um, to, to go down that path with them. Uh, we'll also look at the board. Uh, so our, our work um, hinges heavily on engagement with the board. We do a lot of board development work with the organizations in our portfolio. Um, and we really um, we, we use the board as a strong lever for creating change in the organizations with which we work. Um, and so seeing a, a high quality board uh, from the outset is important to us. Um, and then finally, strategic fit. This really has to do more with, is the organization focusing on issue areas that are a fit for us? So all of our investments focus on unlocking opportunity. And if an organization is, I don't know, beautifying the Boston Common, um, that's, that's a lovely thing to be doing, but that's not going to be a fit for us. Um, so that's just to give you a little bit more color about those criteria specifically. Uh, some of the less common criteria, which I wanted to, to pull out uh, because I think these are talked about a lot in the sector, um, and, and they may not be so important for early stage ventures. Um, so only about half of the organizations that we surveyed um, said that they really weight heavily the quality of an existing strategic plan um, and also a gold standard evaluation. So an RCT or you know, some sort of proven, experimentally proven evidence base. Um, and when you think about that slide that I showed earlier that showed sort of the, you know, the sort of normal curve uh, almost of the um, where funders are just are focusing their funding, um, much of the funding is going towards mid-stage organizations. So for a new profit, that would mean, um, as Kelly has said, you know, or generally early, early in their development, um, they, they might not have had time to really develop and hone their program and run an RCT. Uh, and so for us, we're really betting on the potential, um, not yet the demonstrated, you know, experimentally demonstrated impact. Um, and then I'll also say with the, for the strategic plan, it, it's a similar thing. When you're new in your venture, um, you know, you're, you're really just um, feeling your way around. And um, part of the value that we can add is to, to help our organizations figure out what is the right strategic plan for us at this moment. So another point that I wanted to pull out from this survey that we did is that the field is highly networked. So we asked the organizations that responded to our survey to tell us their top three sources of pipeline leads. Uh, so pipeline organizations, meaning where they might invest. And virtually, so you, you can see here, something like 69% of the, of the organizations selected referrals uh, from peer organizations, from their board and funders, from their staff, and from their own portfolios um, as the top source of leads. And I can speak from personal experience. When I receive an introduction to a pipeline organization from a board member or from a, from a social entrepreneur in our portfolio who I know really understands our work and the value that we add and the raw material that we need in order to add that value, um, that introduction is going to have much more weight with me. And I'm going to approach that conversation um, much more optimistically than I would if I, if I was having a conversation after a cold call. Um, it's not to say that we don't get good leads from cold calls as well. Um, but as you all, or if any of you who are social entrepreneurs, I missed that introductory poll. Um, but if you all are starting ventures, uh, growing ventures, really think about your network, how you can grow your network, and how you can use your network uh, to get the, those powerful introductions to potential supporters. I feel like the takeaway on this, and I'm sure, I mean, this has got to be embedded in what, this is not going to be anything new, but it's, you know, really look at who are the alums who are doing things in your space, like who might you know a couple of steps removed. Talk to everyone about what you're doing because you never know when someone's going to light up about the idea and then be willing to make that introduction. So you just need to be a relentless spokesperson and networker for this. And I know for some people, you know, we don't all start out with these networks. And so that can feel like a little bit intimidating. Um, but if you have the passion and you're not afraid to tell your story, the network can develop over time. Yeah. So 
The field has grown significantly, as I've just described, and we've also seen some great success with our own work. But I think most of our peer funders, I know all of our portfolio social entrepreneurs, and I think also all of our direct funders would agree that we haven't moved the needle nearly enough on the issues that we care about. And so we've been thinking at New Profit about what this means for the next phase of our development. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, sort of the next phase of our strategy, which we're just entering into, to give you a sense of where we're headed next to really try to move the needle more than we have on the issues we care about in the, in the next 15 years. So we're starting something new, but I'm going to, uh, or, or we're, we're building something new, but I'm gonna revisit a uh, little bit about what Kelly talked about at the beginning in terms of the core components of our model. Um, so as you all by now know very well, we select high potential social entrepreneurs who have ideas to transform the, the, the sectors in which they're working. And we support those entrepreneurs with, with resources, with our funding, with our strategic support. Uh, we also advocate for public policy to grow innovative solutions that work, and we convene social entrepreneurs and thought leaders to really create the networks and to build out that ecosystem that we believe is needed to create transformative change. Uh, so we're still doing all of that, but we're doing it in a more targeted way. We're bringing together social entrepreneurs, funders, field leaders to focus on more targeted problems. Uh, so for example, early childhood education or the school to work pipeline. So these people are all focusing on these problems from different angles and we're bringing them together in communities that we're calling domains. And the domains together are co-creating strategies for action that are aligned towards outcomes that are larger than any individual participant could achieve on their own. Um, so it's not just one organization in the domain um, you know, get, getting a certain number of outcomes for the kids that they're serving. It's really changing the practice of how all organizations in this sector are serving kids in needs or beneficiaries in need. It's changing the policies that are influencing where funding is going and, and how our public structure is, is our public system is really supporting uh, individuals' pathways through the system. And it's also changing the culture. Uh, so what does our culture think about early childhood education? Uh, what's our impression about the school to work pipeline? By bringing together groups of people who are focused on a more uh, specific set of issues, we're really able to uh, target our resources and our expertise, and we're really optimistic about the level of change that we'll be able to create. And um, this, uh, this is actually essentially what I just spoke to. Um, and as we pursue our domain approach, I do want to note that we will continue to invest in organizations as we always have. Uh, within the new profit fund. And so this is really just a layering on top of everything that, uh, that you've learned about us so far this evening. And we're, as I mentioned, we're really just in the beginning of this new phase of our work. Uh, so up here you can see a collection of the domains that are, have either been launched or are in development. Um, at this point, we have two domains that are underway, one focusing on the school to work pipeline and another, which will be a publicly launched in early 2015, Reimagine Learning, which focuses on integrating social emotional learning and differentiated learning into the K-12 public school system. Um, and as you can see, we have a variety of domains that are in the pipeline, um, some of which may also be publicly launched next year. So I want to bring us back to where we started. Uh, so We've talked a lot about specifics today. Uh, we've talked about our strategy. We've talked about our investment pipeline, you know, how we select our investments. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the field. Um, but if there's one thing that you take away from uh, this time with us about who New Profit is and what we do, um, I would say that our values uh, would, would be a valuable takeaway. Uh, so I've listed them again up here. and. Um, I want to end on the last value, which is actually one of my favorite of our values, um, get curious. And we say about get curious, uh, we get curious by asserting our views and inviting challenge. And 
so I'm not asking you all to challenge me right now, um, <laughs> but, but I am asking you all to get curious um, and to continue having a dialogue with Kelly and me about anything that um, sparked your curiosity during this presentation. So I wanted to revisit the are we achieving our mission idea that we spoke about earlier. And in the beginning of our conversation, we were talking a little bit about uh, new profits, investments, primarily being focused in nonprofits mm -hmm. and how that may or may not be changing based on how the landscape is changing with social innovation and social enterprise addressing um, some of the problems that nonprofits additionally uh, traditionally address. So I was wondering how your evaluation on achieving your mission is changing as that landscape is changing as well. Yeah. So I would say I'm going to answer one part of your question, which may have been a question underneath the question, which is, are we really going to shift um, the way that we are investing based on the changing landscape? Um, and I would say that if you ask our CEO, I was actually recently at a presentation that Vanessa, our CEO, gave, and uh, she said something like, um, uh, yeah, we know we have a for-profit in our portfolio. We'll invest in anything, for-profit, non-profit. Um, and we're not so casual about it. Um, that, you know, there are big um, implications of shifting our strategy. Um, but at the end of the day, we're about finding the social innovations that work and the leaders who really have the potential to shift their fields. And if those leaders happen to be leading for-profit organizations, uh, it's not going to hold us back from supporting them. Uh, to get technical about it, there are legal issues uh, with a philanthropic, yeah, philanthropic organization funding a for-profit company. And with the one for-profit company in our portfolio, uh, we're actually directly supporting a nonprofit leg of what they do. So, we've, so we sort of have a workaround for that. Um, but I would say, you know, at the end of the day, if it's a promising leader with a, with a promising idea, um, the, their, their a legal status isn't going to stop us from making the right decisions. And on the paper success work, the Massachusetts initiative, we were, I wouldn't say we were forced, but we joined a group of funders who were agreeing to a evaluation framework at the front end, and all of us had to agree on it before we could even go into this partnership, and nobody's going to get funds returned unless we can meet those specific um, benchmarks that were set at the beginning, and that's a five-year program. but. The other thing to say about even the Pay for Success, the Massachusetts initiative, is that we, by contract, in our funding of that initiative, any return that we're able to get, and we're far down the list of people who get paid as results come back from this, but any funding that we get are going to be recycled back to help ROCA, which is the service provider, the recidivism service provider in Chelsea that's just opened a, a, a location in Boston. Any funding we get will go back in to help them scale. Uh, at a national level. And there's another funder in the program who has earmarked any returns to help them scale here in Boston. So it's, you know, I think each of these, each of these issues, have, especially on paper success, is dealt with a little bit differently. But we're going to, I mean, we're going to have to change the way we look at, I mean, it, if you focus on impact, if impact is your guide star, then you're going to, you're going to evolve and change the way you look at some of these things over time, for sure. Thank you. Um, I want to ask about um, maybe examples of uh, organizations that you have recently reviewed or talked to. Mm -hmm. um, the ones that you really, really like, can you tell us especially like what really attracted you to talking to them? And then for an organization that you might have turned down, what are the common mistakes that they have made that uh, resulted in you know being turned down for the application? It just comes something more concrete to think about for us. Thank you. Yeah, I'm trying to think of, I probably shouldn't name names, so I'm trying to think if we have a specific example of recent yeah. conversations. Yeah. So I can talk about an organization that we invested in uh, okay. that feels. Yeah, and I'll think, I'll think of one that we recently did where it wasn't a good conversation, and I can say specifically why it wasn't. Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. I'll talk about the good stuff. Uh, <laughs> So one of the organizations that we invested in, um, I believe it may have actually been last year at this point, but pretty recent investment, um, is called Educators for Excellence. And they are an advocacy organization that 
mobilizes teachers, um, public school teachers, to get involved in their unions um, in a way that looks different uh, from what you think when you think teachers' unions. Um, so they really, they have uh, really grabbed onto the fact that teachers are uh, the future, or teachers are the future, teachers are the most powerful lever, the most uh, significant factor affecting kids' success in a classroom. Um, and so they want to really mobilize and empower teachers to be involved in the policies that affect them day to day um, in their jobs. Um, so when I think about uh, the conversations that we had with Educators for Excellence and you know, why they really stood out, um, so it, it's a little bit of a unique model for us actually in a few ways. Um, but I think you could sort of say that for all of our organizations. We, we tend to, um, again, we follow the impact. Um, but there's a co-leadership model. Um, and they focus on advocacy, which is actually pretty different uh, from most of the organizations in our portfolio. Uh, but what we saw in this organization was that they, their insight was right on, and it was different than the insight of pretty much everyone else we had talked about in this space. Uh, so by mobilizing teachers to really play a role in the policies that are affecting them, it sounds so intuitive, right? Um, but really no other organizations at this scale were doing that kind of work. Um, they had also attracted incredible resources. They had grown at an amazing rate in the years leading up to when we met, the, the couple of years leading up to when we met them, they were still very young. Um, but they were really demonstrating their promise um, to, to sort of continue on an upward trajectory. Um, and then I think another thing that I'll point out is that the co-leadership model actually um, with this organization worked really well. So they had, they had figured out, and so I, this isn't to say co-leadership is the way, this is to say the leader or leaders knew their strengths and were playing to their strengths and had built out a team um, to fill in the gaps um, where they weren't strong. And it was very apparent in the, conversa the early conversations that we had with them, and then especially as we moved through diligence, um, you know, how thoughtful they had been in building out their team to really execute on what they need to do to create the change they're aiming for. Does that answer? That's very helpful. Thank okay. You. Kelly, do you yeah, and that? Yeah, although I'm, I'm, I'll just give a couple more. Yeah, Sam. I can add one that I recently saw too, just to. Okay. I'll add, I mean, yesterday we had a convening of seven amazing female social entrepreneurs who were part of a new accelerator program that we just launched. Um, and I'm thinking about some of the stories that they shared and some of the women who just literally blew my mind. I was like, I'm in awe of these women. Um, and one of them is Alex Bernadotte, who um, has founded Beyond 12, which is, it's a technology platform that um, helps mostly first generation college students uh, basically make their way through college. It's a combination of mentoring, but employing a technology uh, solution for it. And I just think about her personal story and how bold and authentic it is, um, just about um, you know, where she grew up, what her personal journey was, why this is an issue that is deeply personal to her, um, and just how courageous and bold the choices are that she's made in her life. And it's like right there, you know, you hear the nugget of the personal story and the inspiration, and it's like you're hooked. So you're like, okay, I get what makes this person tick. Um, and then you get a sense for, I'm already using data to understand what it is that I'm doing. I know the marketplace, I know who else is doing this, and I know how I compare to what they're doing. Um, and I have a really um, bold aspiration for where I think I can take this thing. And so it's that combination of personal passion, data orientation, bold vision, um, that it's like, wow, this person, you know, I, I want to know more that keeps keeps them guessing. Um, do you have another positive one? I'm, this, I'm, I'm guessing that Matthew and a lot of people around here talk about this all the time, but I recently sat in on a kind of a pitch session for a very, very early stage um, nonprofit. Actually, a very early stage social enterprise because they have not quite decided what their funding model is going to be. But um, the cautionary tale for me is that the first question that everyone asked after hearing this presentation was, you know, we're not sure who your user is, who's the user. And, you know, mantra in the tech world is you can't build anything good unless you really know who your user is going to be and how they can use it and what the cycle of use is going to be. Uh, and that just screamed at us when we were watching the presentation. If you know that piece 
and you have good insight into how your tool is going to be used and you know what the market looks like and how you're going to fit into it and have value. Uh, I mean, that's an obvious thing to say, but it's, it's something that really struck me because I mean, that, that would be, I don't want to call it a death knell by any, I don't mm -hmm. want to be overly negative about it, but if that's the first question you get, I think that's a troublesome sign for sure. Yeah, yeah, I'd say the other common pitfalls, um, I mean, there are a lot of sort of feel-good organizations out there and like no disrespect to them, doing really great work, but can't really articulate what the intended outcome is. So it's like all description of we have this great program, the people feel so good, you know, there's all this great stuff happening. So not specific enough. And when you try to push on what exactly are you looking to change in these people's lives and how would you know if you had changed it, they can't really articulate that. So it's some degree of specificity about the intended outcome and how you understand it. Um, I'd say another common thing, at least for us, is um, you might be doing really great work in one community, and maybe you seem like pretty happy staying there. So at least for us, if the trajectory isn't towards you know, big scale, it's, it's going to be less of a fit. Um, and then I would just say openness to um, feedback and I mean you would just be shocked some people are just they're just totally closed off and when you try to push they won't really engage with you and you think like is this going to be a person who I'm going to want to work with for the next four years probably not if there's not some humility in this and so I'd say that's that's something to just you know be cautious about other common things? Yeah, I would say another one more that I would layer on there that might be actually a little bit more nuanced is we've met some organizations that really hit it out of the park on nearly every di dimension that we're looking at. Um, but they're missing that orientation for real systems level change. Um, so it could be an organization that's scaled, that's producing incredible results, um, you know, that has a social entrepreneur that's really engaging with mm. us and embracing our feedback, um, that can articulate, um, you know, this is the change I'm creating and this is how. Um, but if their focus is just on their program and the outcomes of the beneficiaries that they're working with, uh, for us, that's not going to be enough because we're really we're really focused on leveraged change and leveraged impact. And if if we don't see that orientation in our leaders uh, and the leaders who want to partner with us, uh, it, it's not going to be an effective partnership from on our end. And the counterintuitive there is that you know when you look at our model, a grasp of how policy can be used for scale and how how resources flow and how that ties into. Uh, how social change happens, that's a that's a big plus. I mean, we don't expect people to walk in the door and know the ins and outs of the congressional appropriations process, but a vision to know that just organizational growth is not the, not always the, it can be an answer for some things, but not the answer that we look for at the transformative level is a big plus. And that's, mm -hmm. I don't, I think when you spend, you know, 20 hours a day trying to build your organization, I can totally understand how hard it would be to think about these other things, anything outside your organization, but it is a worthwhile thing to look into and try to keep track of. Yeah. I feel like there was a question over here. Just curious, have you ever funded any more technology oriented or intensive projects? More technology intensive programs? Um, I'd say the probably the tech ones we have, I mentor. Um, is a technology platform that enables mentoring. They have uh, core programs that are in New York that are actually, um, you know, not they're tech enabled, but actually doing face to face mentoring as well. But a lot of their scale play is related to a technology. Um, what else do we have that's tech related? I think new hmm? classrooms. Oh, yeah. Yeah, New Classrooms is a super cool one. Um, they basically, and they're one of our newer investments, they do uh, personalized learning in a really unique way. They basically break down the walls of the traditional classroom and you know, imagine you walk into the class, you look at the screen and it says, Kelly, you know, I, I've spit out your personalized report and based on how you did yesterday, today you're gonna go over here to module one 
and work with a small group on algebra, and then you're going to go over here to the computer and work on your own on something else. So it's literally creating personalized learning profiles for each person based on how they're performing on different tasks. Um, that, one's a, that one's a pretty cool one. And for us, that one, it's actually an expensive model. It was a little bit of a different kind of bet for us. We're actually not convinced it's totally scalable, but it feels disruptive enough that we wanted to, to kind of give it a chance. And the, I mean, you talked about, I think maybe the question you're getting is tech platform-based social enterprise, meaning um, tools, apps, tech, real technology. I mean, we're, what we're talking about here in some cases is organizations that are using technology in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. I think we're inevitably pulled in the direction of, of tech platforms because of their the, the possibility of scale um, and the possibility of transformative scale with, with use of less resources than we've seen with many of these other organizations, but we're, I think we're at the beginning of our journey in that mm -hmm. yeah. direction, but we, it's on our minds. We were talking with, the, with Matthew about it at the beginning of this, definitely on our minds for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think that's so. actually exactly what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, I, I think particularly uh, with our domains, the, the ability to bring together some of our traditional portfolio, you know, what looked like traditional portfolio organizations potentially with a tech platform. Uh, I think it's something that I know we're actively exploring in the early childhood domain, um, and I believe other domains are exploring as well. I think it would also yeah. be worth mentioning the gathering of leaders of, um, and how we're going to be focusing on technology and the intersection between entrepreneurship yeah. and how can, mm -hmm. how can we bring what Silicon Valley and the innovation there and really bring it to the social space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah this will be the second year that our gathering of leaders is on the West Coast, and this year in particular, we'll have a big focus on technology and bringing together some pretty innovative leaders in that space, um, really to help all of us think differently and think bigger about how we can better leverage technology for social solutions. That's a good point. Yeah. I have a question about a comment you made about growth, um, especially in a place like Boston, which is almost a not a metropolis, but it's a mega, you know, you have highly densely populated areas. Um, would you be interested in selecting organizations that would only restrict themselves to a geographic area given the volume of people that can live in a relatively small place? I mean, I know this is te tends to be mostly in the Northeast, you know, New York City, for example, Boston, Washington, D.C., where you may have as many people living in one city as you may have an entire state somewhere else. Um, would that be something you would factor in, or are you only looking at growth from a push-out geographic standpoint, something that you can move elsewhere? Yeah, so I would say it, it's a great question. And um, recently, Kim Simon, who's been with New Profit forever, uh, you know, published an article in Fast Company. And one of the questions that she asked is um, sort of how, how small can you stay to have the impact that you want to have. And so the answer is yes, it's possible if there was a strong strategic decision that staying in one geography was going to enable you to still do something that scaled your solution. So one example um, could be that you intend to use Boston as your R&D lab to develop something that you then aspire to um, scale through a distribution network you know, beyond Boston. And so if that matched the problem and the solution in your vision, I think we would look at that. Um, but if your vision was, you know, we're going to open five different, whatever it may be, workforce development centers throughout the country, and you had only done that in Boston, then we'd probably say, we actually want to see you get to another geography first. Even if it's a failure, we want you to get some lessons from that um, before we would want to step in. Yeah. Do you ever engage with organizations that, despite being having a lot of promise, um, have serious pitfalls or maybe failures, but especially serious pitfalls with the hope that by engaging with them over the four years, you can address those or with that be totally outside of your sort of company that, that you are? Yeah, so 
I mean, I would say we invest in organizations who wind up having serious pitfalls. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> Within those four years. <laughs> Um, you know, and some even beyond those four years. And so, you know, there's something about our own risk tolerance that I think we wrestle with and we're experimenting with. And we actually, I think, are moving to a place where we're becoming a little bit less risk averse. Like, we want to take at least a handful of riskier bets. Um, but I generally, at the beginning, if we're seeing a lot of pitfalls, um, it's just such a competitive pool that we would have to see such tremendous potential in something to, for that to outweigh you know, the pool of other applicants that we have. But I'm curious, are, are there specific pitfalls that you have in mind? No, I guess I'm just, it, it's also getting at another question that I have, which is what the sort of support that you provide is mm -hmm. during those four years. And, if, if it can be uh, sort of engaged enough or, or deep enough where, where you can hope to actually transform, be transformative yourselves of, of other organizations. Yeah. 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 Do you want to take that? Yeah. So I would say that, as I talked about before, we need to see the, the critical raw ingredients. Um, but every organization we invest in, in our investment memo, we it's really thoroughly detail what are the strengths and what are the risks that we see with this investment. Um, and so I would say that we have, over the years, um, you know, we've built out a, a set of expertise, we've built out a skill set um, where there are a set of challenges or risks that we know we're well equipped to help organizations handle. Um, and a lot of those relate to common challenges of a, a growing enterprise. Um, so issues related to you know, growth of the senior team or the board or uh, maybe not being fully clear on the theory of change, although it seems like there's really something there. Um, and so I would say that we, we do, you know, we will bring organizations in that need, all of our organizations need a lot of work. We, every organization needs a lot of work and support. Um, but I would say that we select for the pitfalls that we are uniquely suited to help organizations overcome. And th then another, another um, just comment I would make about your first question is that uh, the life cycle of an organization is so dynamic. And so I think what Kelly and I both thought of, um, you know, when you first asked that question, Kelly said, well, you know, we've invested in organizations and then found out about pitfalls. Um, and I think that that, I mean, that's just, that's just the life of an entrepreneur, um, you know, that our organizations are working in incredibly volatile environments, unpredictable environments, and part of our commitment when we make an investment is to really ride through those ups and downs um, with the social entrepreneurs in their organizations, knowing that the raw material is there. And it's, I mean, we're built for this, that when most of the organizations we're working with are about to make a major move into scaling, into making, and that the leap that that takes from a personnel standpoint, from a funding standpoint, from a leadership standpoint, from a technology standpoint, internal, there's almost nothing that isn't touched when you're ready to do something like that. So I think that every organization we work with is gonna confront challenges. And I think the, the really close and strong partnership, uh, person on the board, a Deloitte case team that works with every organization. Those are the things that we build in to try to help, really to try to help a leader manage those processes or those uh, barriers and, and pitfalls that come along when you're making a big move towards growth and scale, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could you give examples um, of when you're uh, the category of workforce development? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so one example that I would put into this category is Year Up. Are you familiar with Year Up? So they're an organization that works with high school students um, who are struggle who are really struggling, um, and they place them into um, sort of paraprofessional um, placements essentially, um, and pair that paraprofessional placement with education um, to help students move through their education, but also be prepared to succeed. Um, in the workforce. So that's one example. I will say that a, a small, it's only a small number of our organizations that focus on workforce issues. Um, and it's something that I've had some conversations with some of our peer funders about um, that we, we really don't see as many pipeline organizations that focus on workforce coming our way. Uh, so if 
if that's of interest to you, I'd be curious to talk to you about what's behind that question um, after this presentation. Yeah, and there are a couple of others that are, um, they're like sort of fits for that. So I think about just today, I was meeting with the Mission Continues, who works with veterans. And I certainly don't think they would define themselves as a workforce development organization, yet a huge part of what they do is work with veterans who've returned from Iraq and Afghanistan to transition successfully back into civilian life. And a big part of that is around um, skills and training and connection to employment. Um, and so it's just one part of what they do, but I think it falls there. And we've actually seen you know, a handful of pipeline organizations who are doing interesting things in training people to do things like um, sort of, uh, I'm thinking about uh, Elizabeth Shepard and Green City Force. So it's training people to do work that ultimately has an impact on the environment. So it's sort of a dual, um, you know, a dual win, because you're training young people to be able to transition into more successful employment, but also what those young people are doing is doing something that's beneficial for the community. And I would just add Roca to that list. Um, yeah. Workforce development, and then also, I mean, policy tends to be an opportunistic approach. And this year, uh, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act was really one of our major core focus areas mm -hmm. for America for which is the policy arm, and that really the only bipartisan bill that passed Congress this year. Uh, the point of it was to open up incentivizing money across the country in local areas to do pay for success uh, initiatives, and that's going to be mainly focused on disconnected youth and in getting into the workforce and workforce development as a broader topic. So that, that I mean, if that goes really well, we would think that there'd be some, hopefully there'd be some pipeline organizations in the future that have come out of that setting. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of our workforce development work is through our policy arm, um, more so than the organizations that we invest in are the same, because we just, um, we, America Ford actually helped with the WIA bill um, and getting that passed and including the pay for success um, legislation in there. So. Yep. Um, B Corps are a fairly new thing, like a lot of states haven't. I mean, Massachusetts, I think it was like 2012 or something when they actually passed the legislation around it. Mm -hmm. Do you see those just, I, it's kind of just a broad macro question, like, mm -hmm. do you see that as like a, a big growth area? Do you see that as sort of being in competition in a way with sort of a, a traditional not-for-profit or, you know, just, is it is it sort of its own category? Or do you see that kind of at some point perhaps like, you know, competing directly with, with traditional nonprofits? and just kind of what are your thoughts on? Right. Yeah, it's, it's hard to know how the, the trend will go. I feel like there is so much buzz around this. And I'm curious, being on a university campus, like I imagine that it's an assumption that many people might think, oh, social innovation, I want it to be a B Corp. I want it to be um, you know, somewhere at this hybrid. And maybe nonprofits have kind of lost some of their sexiness. Um, and so I don't know if that's a trend and that's going to you know, fizzle out or if we're really going to see a big expansion there. Um, in terms of competitiveness, um, there's so much need that's, that exists in the spaces where nonprofits and B Corps uh, work that I don't see direct competitors in terms of uh, working with the individuals who are in need of services. And in terms of the, um, the funding, um, I actually know less about whether B Corps can accept uh, the type of philanthropy that a traditional nonprofit can accept. And so um, my sense would be that philanthropy will still flow through intermediaries or directly to uh, nonprofit organizations, and that I think a B Corp, um, whatever the economic engine is, you believe that you can actually do more than break even with a minimal surplus, and that it can actually be profitable. I don't know if you'd add anything to it. No, yeah, I think that's right. And uh, yeah, I think I would just really emphasize that um, more is more uh, in this sector, and so I don't. I also don't see competition as an issue, and I think a new profit as a firm, um, you know, is 
very supportive and really energized about the different financing mechanisms that are um, emerging and that are developing. So, so your perspective is more that as long as they're delivering impact, it's in a sense it's just a it's it's really just a in a sense it's almost a not for profit with a different funding mechanism as opposed mm -hmm. to something different entirely. That is kind of what it sounded like you were. That that's saying. yeah that's how I would think about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We can, um, uh, if you have other questions at the end, if you guys have time, you don't mind sure. uh, taking that. But yeah, um, absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll stop here on this workshop. I want to uh, greatly thank Kelly, Leah, Alex, um, and uh, Sam for your effort in uh, putting this workshop together and representing New Profit mm -hmm. and sharing your insights with our entrepreneurs and uh, the community. So thank you all for being here tonight. Get home safely. And please thank uh, our guests here tonight. Thank you.